How are you doing? It is uh, Thursday, September 28th. It's my dad's birthday. Happy birthday, Dad. Um, Ruxin's podcast. I'm Mark Ross. With me as always, Gerald Ashley. Gerald, how are you? What is happening? Uh, Mark, I'm well. Uh, we've just sailed through the autumn equinox, so I guess it is definitely autumn. So, um, UK Met Office, Meteorological Office, insist, insists that autumn starts on the 1st of September, but who cares? Um, we are starting to see uh, a few leaves fall off the trees. So that's my usual sort of fortnightly weather update. As to what's going on in what's going on in the UK, it's kind of much the same as before. Um, and politics rumbles along in the same way. And in a sense, I think we're in a little bit of a holding pattern uh, on the um, political front until the big year next year, which will be a general election, I think. And in terms of the economy, um, Britain's cheering at the fact that the economy is flatlining. That is these days seen as some sort of triumph. Um, whereas, um, you know, to be a bit more serious, situation, particularly in Germany, is not very good at all. And it's, it's, it's not much point being partisan about these things, because if a major economy like Germany's, um, you know, heading to recession and, and going down, it doesn't help any of the rest of us. So that's the kind of mood music. So it's a bit flat and I guess it's a bit autumnal. <laughs> well, it's definitely brisk here. It's been in the uh, 60s in DC and it's definitely, it's amazing, you know, just like that, fall comes, the cooler temperatures, the heat goes away. So here we are, but speaking of heat, we're gonna talk about hydrogen, the fuel of the future, possibly. What do you think? Uh, yes, I've always liked hydrogen, um, but let's put an immediate caveat in. Um, uh, British listeners and viewers of a certain vintage will remember a TV program called Tomorrow's World. And this was one of these sort of whiz-bang popular science programs that ran from the 1960s, I think, until about the early 1990s. And it had some fantastic things like one of the very first mobile phones, one of the first electronic calculators. And I think I'm right in saying I, I was in short trousers uh, when I first saw a hydrogen powered car. And um, being of a particularly impressionable age, I was that stunned that the uh, there was no exhaust fumes, but in fact, water came out of the tailpipe, as, as you guys would say. So obviously it's an old technology, it's been around, um, it's been developed a lot, and it seems to be um, coming up the, the hit parade a little bit in terms of where we go forward with um, uh, you know, uh, energy in general, and I think in particular in, in transport. Um, there are people who decry it, um, but I think increasingly uh, we've got to get away from the idea there's a single winner in this, in, in, in this sort of new energy world. You know, that people bang on about EVs and then other people say, oh, they're nonsense and they're not going to happen. Um, I think it, what we're going to end up with is quite a, um, a sort of menu or a portfolio of different approaches. And I think hydrogen starts to fit in there. Um, we have hydrogen buses in, uh, in London. Um, there's been some talk of developing hydrogen powered trains. Um, one area I think where they may be good is in long distance uh, uh, trucking, because um, dear old e Elon Musk's truck seems to be mainly taken up with carrying the batteries. I don't actually understand whether there's any room on his truck to actually carry anything. And so I think it may be that, that hydrogen, you know, maybe use the American phrase, those long distance semis, you know, they may, they may go hydrogen. Um, to pull that into focus as to what's happened this week, um, didn't get a lot of headline news, but it may be significant, quite a big bilateral deal between the UK and Germany um, on hydrogen development and hydrogen production and basically gearing it up in a big way over the next five years. That's significant, of course, because as we know, the German government administration are all over the place with their energy policy. Um, they they have a long hit list of everything they hate. Um, but of course, day to day, they've got to power the economy. And so maybe 
in amongst all of that, hydrogen may get a bigger shout than otherwise. And then final, final sort of point on this uh, blast of detail. Um, viewers and listeners may recall, was it three or four episodes, we talked quite a lot about Nissan and how Nissan was the, really the major uh, auto company uh, on, a, on the global stage that was putting you know, big bucks into hydrogen. Um, they weren't just going to bet everything on EVs. Obviously, they are going to be big in EVs, and they already are, but they seem to be the best-placed car company for hydrogen. So um, H is the letter of the week. Whether it will be just for this week or for the next 10 or 20 years, we wait to see, but it, it, it's certainly more prominent. Well, um, yeah, hydrogen, as you well know, is the most abundant. I guess it's the simplest element in the universe, which is pretty powerful. So I, there's got to be a way that we can find and use it. I, I got to think, too, I don't know this. I don't remember from my chemistry days, but it would also seem it has to be lighter to move, right? I mean, one of the big challenges with EVs is just the weight of the battery, right? So moving a battery causes so much friction, so much energy use. I would think that hydrogen has got to be lighter to move and no exhaust is fantastic. I think one of the challenges from my understanding too is the way hydrogen is processed. They talk about green energy, green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, yeah, yeah. brown, gray, and these different uh, processes. But a lot of it still can be carbon captured and can repurpose coal. And it has a tremendous amount of use across the board, uh, industry, home, et cetera, transportation, as you talked about. So I think it's really exciting. I mean, the big, the most sensible people, I think, are the ones that, like, the language that people use in D.C. is across the board energy mix, right? That is, like, we need every possible tool at our disposal. There's different applications for different fuels, but we need them all. And to bet all on one source is pretty crazy. Um, but it would seem to me more and more hydrogen is going to come into play. Yeah. We talked about the U.K. and Germany. There's stories out of Australia, what they're doing. There's African countries like Nambia that are getting more focused on hydrogen. It does seem like there's a lot of energy, no pun intended, around this fuel source and a lot of applications. Um, EVs sound cool, but you still need to generate the E, right? I mean, that's like the thing that we really talked about. And yeah, I think I, you're going to yeah. need a fuel. We're going to need more fuel sources. Yeah, look, we're we're um, we're going to be in violent agreement on this one. There is actually, from your point of view, an interesting comms stroke PR angle, which until quite recently people used to say, "Oh, I'm going nowhere near a hydrogen car because it'll blow up." Because do you remember that dreadful explosion of the Hindenburg in the Hindenburg? Correct. Yeah. Um, and a lot of you know, I think the the man on the street is slightly worried we'd be going around driving a, uh, some form of bomb. Um, but of course, the reality is uh, fuel cell technology um, is rather more sophisticated than that. It's contained in a, in a liquid form inside the, some form of, of, of sponge and all the rest of it. So it's, a, and then it's gradually released as a hydrogen. So it's, it, you know, it is, it's kind of clever stuff. Um, and I think it's, it's interesting that that sort of Hindenburg oh my God moment seems to have gone away. Well, I think also what's interesting is um, also from a cons perspective is obviously there's been so much investment in coal and oil, especially here in the United States. And those are 30, 40, maybe even 50 year bets. So it's hard to get somebody to switch. It's also, you know, there's, uh, I just think like when I think about admirals, right? Like they're really excited about battleships, right? When it seems that yeah. much more autonomous and drones may be much more useful for a future Navy. But as you know, as you sit in these boardrooms and you're like, listen, I want to have a giant you know, nuclear reactor. It's something I can see is ginormous. There could be something holding back hydrogen because it's just frankly not that sexy, the way it's processed or, you know, it's just yeah, simple yeah. chemistry. Um, you know, chemistry sometimes isn't as exciting as seeing a giant coal mine digging up dirt sure. and moving rock. So the comms effort around that is interesting. I, it's interesting why it didn't really take off. I guess there was just much more abundance around oil and gas to refine it and why didn't that do we i don't really know why hydrogen didn't take off when you were in your short short I, I i think it was ignored for a long time because people didn't worry about the oil and gas industries now we've seen the emergence of, of for want of a better phrase the electricity market um and now that has that's um my turn to do the pun now that has energized people to think about well what are the whole 
sort of suite of possibilities. And in many ways, it would be quite easy for the natural gas and oil industry to flip towards hydrogen, far easier than to try and get into the the messy business of, of, of battery um, design and construction, where they have no comparative advantage and have absolutely no history or background of management and, and in-house skills. So you could imagine, you know, a, a Chevron or a Shell or somebody like that finding it pretty straightforward to move in a big way into hydrogen if, if that's the way uh, the world starts to move. I think just thinking about this too, like maybe the connection around this is one of the two main ways to generate hydrogen is through coal and methane gas, which is you know horrible to environmentalists that are just like they can't even think about coal whatsoever. And in reality, you know, as you talked about, most of the stuff at the end of the day is a chemical process. And the question is, you know, it's simple. It's not simple chemistry. It's pretty complex chemistry, but it's chemistry nonetheless. And there's ways to extract different elements. And I wonder if that is holding back hydrogen on a big scale because the environmentalists would much rather see windmills and solar because there's absolutely no connection to coal and that coal connection could be holding hydrogen back it's a stretch but you could you well it's not a stretch but you could use renewable energy to uh, produce hydrogen by cracking water um, but then equally you could do that maybe more efficiently through nuclear power and so there may be a more obvious spin-off between nuclear power and hydrogen than between uh, renewables and hydrogen. But I just sense it isn't going away. But whether it's going to be 1% of the market or 50% of the market, uh, to be frank, I don't think anybody knows. There are some sort of uh, maybe slightly wacko ideas in the UK for it to replace the domestic natural gas supply for uh, heating in homes. But there, there are a heap of reasons why that would be difficult to do, not least of which the, the quality and um, uh, safety element of, of the natural gas uh, system that goes into domestic properties. It's probably, it's probably not going to happen. Then some people say you can mix hydrogen with that, you know, hardly the right phrase, but you can water it down, you can water <laughs> natural gas down with hydrogen. There's, there's a mixed metaphor, if you've ever heard one. But so that all, all the time, it's not totally dismissed. I mean, if we we're going to play the game, one I think we should dismiss, and this may cause a flood of letters from infuriated listeners and viewers, um, is solar. I think the, the case of solar is incredibly weak. It's certainly in, uh, incredibly weak in the Northern Hemisphere in Europe. And there are lots of calculations that say, the amount of energy you get out the end compared to actually building this stuff and then installing it and then how do you decommission it when it has eventually worn out um it's very marginal if you actually has any effect if you stick it in the uh, sahara desert fantastic but then you've got the small issue of how do you transmit the electricity you know across the mediterranean even as far as just spain or italy so there are no easy answers to any of this stuff but if I had to pick on one I'd get rid of, it would be solar. And I can feel the ceiling coming down on my head as I say that. Well, I think this is definitely a space to watch. I, I'm thinking this through. Australia might be the power player here. Uh, you know, it's obviously a resource-rich economy. They're very close to Asia. Obviously, the connection with the Japanese automotive companies, China, et cetera, India. Australia, I don't know. Maybe they make this pivot. They go all in. I mean, I, I would guess. I don't, I don't know, 20, 30 percent of the Australian economy has got to be tied around natural resources, wow. could even be higher. So maybe they going all in a big kind of G7, G8 country, maybe they lead the way and um, it's a space to watch. But it, it may take a huge commitment from a country saying we're going all in. Yeah, you can't get away from that old phrase about Australia that they're the lucky country. And I think, you know, maybe they've been lucky with natural resources in mainly mineral resources, obviously not least of which coal. Um, but maybe they'll get lucky with um, new sources of energy as well. Be interesting. Well, let's pivot to, uh, this is a good segue, because I think I was thinking about this the other day. So the UAW here in the United States of America is striking against the big three. Uh, a lot of it, to me, this could be the first EV 
strike. That is, this is the first strike where the automotive unions are saying, hey, man, we need to figure out what the hell is happening with EVs. And if you look at what happened in Hollywood or on the writer's strike, same thing. That's an AI-generated strike. So we're seeing these new technologies finally come in. Uh, one of the big challenges with EVs around, well, if you're a worker, is that less workers are needed to make EV-driven cars. And if you're an auto worker, that's not a great situation. So the EV situation is one to watch. I, I'm This idea of like the first EV strike is something that we can't ignore, coupled with obviously inflation and just this general malaise in the United States. Um, what are you thinking about the automotive strike? And is it really yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, the first long-term comment is welcome back to the 19th century where people were worried by technology that was going to take their jobs away. Um, which is true if you were a deckhand on a sailing ship and was true if you were um, helping dig canals or run canals. Um, and of course, transport moved on and those jobs had to change. Um, bringing it much more up to date, I think already it sounds like it's going to get very politicized because um, uh, your, your, your great friend, as we know, oh ho, uh, Mr. Trump is already saying that, you know, the EV is some sort of, I don't think he used this exact phrase, but some sort of Trojan horse that is going to, uh, you know, destroy automotive jobs and all the rest of it. And you're right, um, we are at some sort of inflection point where a lot of technologies are really challenging traditional ways of doing things. And as you say, in AI, and I think we discussed this a couple of shows ago, if you have a job that is remotely replicable, is basically turn the handle and repeat time after time, you're in trouble and uh, with AI. And you know, that doesn't need to be mechanical. It could be you've got a quite a, a middle to low ranking job in a law firm where you're plowing through loads of documentation. Or equally, you may be a junior accountant where you're plowing through endless stats and statistics and spreadsheets all of which could be easily done with machine learning. And so, yeah, watch this space. And it may mean industries that in the past have not been particularly unionized um, will become so because people become threatened. One doesn't normally think of junior lawyers or paralegals joining unions, but you know, who knows? It's something to watch. Yeah, I think with the uh, what's happening in Hollywood, even though the writers have agreed to work with the movie studios, they are actually going to uh, strike against the video game industry, which frankly is actually a bigger industry than Hollywood. Uh, a lot of similarities, of course, but there's people that actually write the stories that go in video games, etc. A lot of AI, a lot of tech, a lot of coding. So certainly a space to watch. What's interesting about this, uh, you mentioned this, you know, the buggy whips or the canals. I mean, I don't know if you know the, the backstory between Michigan and Ohio. Ohio, Michigan, of course, is the automotive state. But before that, Ohio was the leader in horse-drawn carriages. They had the entire industry, wheels, carriages, the whole deal. This guy up in Detroit, Henry Ford, was like, why don't we put a motor on this, this cart? <laughs> it can go faster. The whole world shifts. And we're still seeing that. Even well, resentment it's the old, today. It's the old story. You know, you um, if you can't beat them, join them. And there does come a point when technology pushes things to a certain uh, level. If you don't move with it, you you know you're finished. And um, uh, whether we, whether AI, I don't particularly like this term AI because I'm I'm not convinced it actually is artificial intelligence. But nevertheless. Um, Let's, I prefer machine learning, but if machine learning gets a real grip in some industries, it's going to have dramatic changes. Um, and not just in the traditional industries. I mean, you think some of the announcements that are coming out now about how search engines and everything may change a great deal. And was it a couple of days ago? Uh, hard to believe, but it was the 25th anniversary of Google. Yeah, and just yesterday. That is, that's mind boggling. Alarming. I yeah, which it. isn't really that old, but it's also yeah. like I use it's always been, every, I use it feels it. like it's always been there. But yeah, their, their business model could be under titanic pressure. Um, if if some of this, uh, okay, we'll stick with AI. If some of this AI stuff um, is incorporated into rival search engines, and let's not forget they emerged amongst an alphabet soup of different 
so-called web crawlers and search engines at the time. You know, whatever happened to Netscape? Whatever happened to Alta Vista? You know, whatever happened to Mosaic? All these names of, you know, their history book stuff. Um, and we, like, like all of us, we all remember the winners and we don't remember everybody who's been left behind. So Google is king of the hill, but, you know, they have to be careful and they've got to be on top of it, which I'm sure they are, but they, they've got to be careful. To, uh, yeah, I want to bring this back because I think it's, it's really this EV AI world is interesting because as, as before we got on the pod, we we're talking about Joe Biden actually went to the picket line in uh, Wayne, Michigan, the suburb of Detroit. Uh, it, it's our understanding it was the first time a U.S. president ever went on a picket line. But I've had a really good authority that uh, team, White, team Biden at the White House did talk to the leadership at General Motors, the C-suite, and said, you know, I, don't, I obviously don't know the exact conversation, but I think it went along the lines of like, listen, man, the politics here demand that I be a part of this. Like I, but I also, by the way, because the, the industrial policy is all in vogue, you know, Biden's also going to tell the, the executives at General Motors, stay true, you know, keep committed to EVs, keep investing in America. So it also gets back to AI. I, I, over a few weeks, I've gone to two different AI conferences. And one of the overwhelming things I keep hearing is promise and peril, right? There's like, we're going to cure cancer. The promise is we're going to cure cancer. We're going to solve climate change. But the peril is deep fakes, you know, rockets being shot off by AI. All this. So it, I think the world right now is in this very promise and peril kind of situation around these new technologies and where it's you kind of sit on them. Because there's a push a, to bring them in. Fluid. It's yeah. quite a fluid um, situation. And then maybe to pull a slightly UK focus on all of this, this is where I think the UK government feel that they can somehow get involved um, in some form of maybe global regulatory authority of AI. I, yeah. I have I have my doubts about whether that will actually ever happen. Um, who, who knows? Um, and Prime Minister, Mr Sunak, who's a bit of a sort of you know, tech geek, uh, this stuff appeals to him at a personal level. And maybe the UK is sufficiently independent to do that. Though I would have thought if I was in China, I would just assume the UK is is the lapdog of the United States, to be honest. But it, it, we'll see how all this pans out. Well, and speaking of Sunak, he made an amazing pivot, a U-turn. Uh, I don't know what other, you, you know, what other uh, I don't know, front automotive phrases can we use? A handbrake turn. turn. You want a handbrake turn. Oh, yeah, sorry. Handbrake turn. That's a very Sky News. Yeah. Handbrake turn, delaying the ICE engine, and uh, polling suggests it increased the numbers, even though, you know, they probably won't save them by 10 or 15 points. Here again, industrial policy. I want, you know, Sunak wants to be green, but oh my gosh, I got to get reelected. How do I keep these people happy? This technology is great, but oh my gosh, we're not ready for it. I mean, this is the <laughs> this is like the vibe of the United States and the United Kingdom right now in democracy well, this, around the world. Like, you know, carrying on with not very good automotive analogies, this is when the rubber hits the road, right? When the when the actual costs of some of these grand ideas that have spun out of think tanks and let's be honest, gigantic lobbying organizations on all sides. You know, we have a huge renewable lobby in the UK. Sounds like we're getting a hydrogen lobby going. Um, the car makers in the UK are absolutely up in arms uh, with regard to EVs because uh, there's a sort of three way battle between the car industry, the UK government, and our dear friends, the EU in Brussels, over how much European content there has to be in an EV car. And the sort of elephant in the room, um, another form of transport, I guess, um, is that, of course, most of the technology is going to come from China. And how do you square that particular circle? And whilst this three-way fight is going on, I think the Chinese are going to swamp the global market with much cheaper EVs. And that will be a really interesting point because that will be the point that do EVs really take off because of the price point has come down or it doesn't work. That I think is a really crunch thing that's coming. And if you're an environmentalist and you think climate is the number one issue and you think automotive emissions is the number one issue, why do you care? where the technology comes from.
right? Like you should like, why does it matter that it's coming from communist China, right? This is the interesting crux. And I don't think it's going to, it's definitely not going to get solved. In fact, I think it's going to get more intense. Uh, even Tesla's getting wrapped up in this EU thing, right? I mean, Tesla, yeah. American company, heavily invested in China, using China as an export platform to Europe. Tesla, Elon Musk, the, you know, the, the, the poster boy of the future is now wrapped in geopolitics. I, I think we're entering, for me, a very exciting time. But I think for electorates and for voters and for prime ministers, oh, my gosh rough seas ahead well i mean we it's always remember that um pessimism always sells so you know it's always good if, you know if you're looking for audiences maybe we should be more even more pessimistic than we are i don't know but i think you know it is a two-sided coin there's a lot of exciting technologies out there um and it's it's whether we can overcome the feeling of threat that some of them will will pose and that depends to a lot of it. a lot of it is on, on on almost personal circumstances um the formula one thing that to... i saw mentioned in a uk uh, business magazine this week was that evs will not take off in the uk until you can buy a car for under thirty thousand pounds that will do 500 miles range and you can recharge it in 15 minutes now that's a hell of a Venn diagram if you think about it, and EVs are nowhere near that. And I think to myself, yeah, I, you know, I'd do that. I would buy that, but I'm not going to go and buy a Fiat 500, which would just about get me in it. They cost nearly forty thousand pounds, and if you drive really carefully, you get 190 miles out of them, uh, and then you've got to go and charge them for Lord knows how long. So you know that formula, that formula of you know. 500 miles under 30 grand sterling and 15 minute recharge is a hell of a tall order to meet. Um, but I think that's the true challenge. Well, yeah. And you also, for me also, I think this idea around industrial policy, bureaucrats and all these you know national capitals around the world thinking they can tinker with the economy, they think they know best, not taking in human behavior, et cetera. And as, as we all know, things look great on a PowerPoint, but when they get into the cold wind of reality, the EVs don't move as fast. That's How when you that for poetry. It's that desperate leap of going from vaporware to hardware, right? <laughs> I love vaporware. I'm pro vaporware. Um, well, that's your industry, isn't it? You are in the vaporware industry. Dude, it's just out there, man. Um, speaking of just out there, let's talk about Canada and India. I mean, who had this on their Venn diagram? With potential spat. Um, if you're not following the story, a Sikh in Vancouver was assassinated. Uh, the Canadian government, Justin Trudeau, is suggesting the Indian secret police made a hit, an assassination of this. What's interesting, the Sikhs in India, if you don't know, are looking for an, an independent land uh, out towards uh, Afghan or Pakistan, right? Up that way in the north. And there are a million Sikhs in Canada. It's one of the largest. It's the largest population outside of India lives in Canada. So obviously a huge political issue. Also, I mean, sovereignty, you can't, you know, I mean, no government can allow other governments to come in. We saw what happened with Theresa May and the Russians and uh, they're very hostile. So um, to me, it's, then the, interesting it's, gone, go it's interesting it's gone public. Why did Trudeau feel he had to do this publicly and say, you know, say to the Indians, look, we know what's happened here. We're very unhappy about it. And you need to sort it out. Um, well, there's a high-ranking Sikh in the, you know understand really. Well, there's a high-ranking Sikh in Justin Trudeau's government who would have been privy to this information. So I think it'd be very hard. There was also it seems so obvious from just reports I've read that this wasn't a random act. Like it just seemed right. like too professional and and this guy was outspoken and like and then the geopolitics of it. I mean. Modi, as you know, the BBC ran a great documentary. He's been very nationalistic. He's sowing his oats. You know, this idea is going to change the name of India. Um, he's also like, this is our time, et cetera. What is interesting, the geopolitics of it. Um, yeah, why did they do that? Because there was a big brush up. Like, did the Canadians know or did the US know? Did the UK know? Why aren't they leaning on India? Why aren't they saying something about Modi? Why is uh, Modi's actions different than what MBS did, et cetera? 
Yeah, so why did it come out? I think, uh, just because I said, I think the people at the top of the Canadian government and just a large population of Sikhs in Canada um, had to do that. And frankly, you know, I don't know if it really, the spat between Canada and India now is like delaying visas and yeah, whatnot. I mean, I'm not sure the size of the trade, but, you know, there's a huge Indian population in Canada. I think that's where the it, genesis it, is. It's a bit like the Cold War, isn't it, where people start, you know, um, ejecting one another's diplomats and then withdrawing visas and all this stuff. It's quite extraordinary. Um, and of course, in the background, like every, everywhere at all times, there are trade agreements and there's an Indian Canada trade agreement, which unsurprisingly is now on ice. Um, I don't know what, where this all goes other than maybe both governments hope it'll all kind of fade in the headlines and, in six months time we won't talk about it and you know when these things are very vivid people say oh no this is so serious but i'll give an example of something that was so serious a year ago and i never hear about was the blowing up of the um uh, gas pipeline in the baltic nobody <laughs> talks about it and uh, i mean it, it not only was it a, a big story it is still a big story but you, you know forget it nobody's Nobody's remembered it. So are we in a situation that when we do two or three editions down the road, all of this will be long forgotten? Well, I think it's the one year anniversary of the Nord pipeline, Nord Stream pipeline. So I don't think that's going to go away. Yeah, I mean, that's completely bizarre. And yeah, even this announcement, you're right. I mean, this happens after the G20 summit, right? It doesn't happen during the summit. It doesn't happen before. Yeah. So clearly people were saying, hey, man, like we got to go to hang out with Modi. We got to deal with India. Um, I think the other interesting, I just thought about this. Canada's had this problem with the Chinese government poking off uh, parliamentarians, influencing the elections. You know, in Canada is one of these like perfect countries. Right. I mean, it's obviously an important piece of geography. It's got huge allies in the UK and the United States, but it's you know not big enough to like command and control India and China. So all this stuff. I, it was possible that Trudeau was like, listen, I get, this is going to come out eventually. I've got to get this out there. Um, so leak it when it's, or talk about it after the G20. But I don't know. I think it, it's an interesting situation to have allies or democracies assassinate people and do crazy stuff like blow up pipelines. I mean, it, it, the Cold War, it seems like it's still hot and heavy. Well, um, and this is a, a trivial point, but it may be a, a useful career pointer that all of these stories create the most wonderful plots for people who want to write thrillers. I mean, nobody would have written a thriller that involves India and Canada in some sort of diplomatic standoff with a planned assassination. In fact, if you wrote that up and sent it into a publisher, they'd tell you to clear off. But it does show that, you know, um, the world of thriller writing is, is, is ever wider. No, it is. It's um, these secret service. Like one of the first people the Canadians threw out was the uh, you know secret police attaché in Ottawa. So yeah, they're all watching each other. The spies watching the spies. Like yeah, living in D.C., it's interesting because like uh, the spies are just constantly watching. You know, they're they're watching each other all the time. And even there's one of the big things about even the camera situation, the CCTVs in China. I mean, obviously it has to do with their own citizens, but it's also watching, you know, foreign diplomats sure. wandering around Beijing. I mean, now they can track these people much more readily. Uh, you know, the Canadian, the Chinese famously, maybe it's been eight years or 10 years now, cleared, like basically cleared out the entire CIA network. So, you know, the reports suggest that the U.S. has very little intelligence, like lost a major network. Um, a lot had to do with like the Chinese tracking these people down and following each other. Um, but yeah, I agree. Um, there's no way, even AI, I don't think would have created a film script involving the Canadians and the Indians diplomatic well, thriller, but yeah. there we are, Ottawa and uh, New Delhi. Maybe we should get on the keyboards and start writing some stuff up. <laughs> I haven't been to Ottawa. I'm desperate. I've heard it's one of the coldest capitals in the world in terms of mm -hmm. the winter, its location, but I've been to Delhi and that is a wild place. So, but that would be fun. Let's do it. Well, I'm, I'm ready. To, I'm always ready to take meetings and uh, pitch, pitch ideas. It's my favorite activity. So, what does that bring us to? What we're reading, maybe? What we're reading and watching. Speaking of pitching, do you want to go first? 
Yeah, I'll go first and I'll, I'll keep up the generally pessimistic tone. Um, <laughs> and this is a minor classic. It's a great book. Uh, the edition I've got is written in 1979. And I can't believe that's the first edition. It's a book. It's got a great title. It's called Manias, Panics and Crashes by Charles Kindleberger. And it's that, sounds like a, that sounds like a Clash album. Yeah. <laughs> well, straight away, you know, even the 1979 edition is predating the crash of 87, the dot-com crash, the, the global credit fiasco of 2008. And... Um, Okay, it's a cliche to say that these things just keep coming round and round and round. And it's not just the panics and the crashes. It, it, the mania part is quite important. And I think that's going to be, again, we can't avoid um, uh, this whole excitement about AI at the moment. It's, you know, uh, uh, quite a distinguished correspondent in Bloomberg yesterday uh, made the point, well, what, our, what our happens if AI is just like really dull? And doesn't actually do much you know hundreds of billions of dollars are riding on this latest crest of the wave and if it just turns out to be a square wheel you know if all it means is i can turn my blog into uh, shakespearean sonnets or uh, you know sort of party tricks like that what's the point so it's these books are always an interesting corrective because you can kind of see the um the patterns of excitement and then despair that go on. So there we are. Manias, Panics and Crashes, Charles Kindleberger, um, still in print, which in itself is a, a sign that it, it's, it's a relevant book. Love it. What are you, are you watching anything? Well, what am I watching? And this reading. fits in as well. I'm watching the uh, latest Rolling Stones video, Angry. So there it's we go. It's a great song. It's a great tune. It's, so it's not a bad song, but I'm going to, again, maybe chuck a small brick in the pond here. Um, a, a number of people have pointed out that it may be slightly formulaic. It kind of is a, it's instantly recognizable as a Rolling Stone song. And, I mean, dude, they're 80 years old. I mean, yeah, and have they just ripped off, you know, it's a modernized version of Start Me Up or whatever. Actually, I think it's very good. I like it. It's got rather a, a clever video. Um, again, draw. we cannot get away from this stuff. Again, drawing on AI and CGI to pick up loads of old clips that are then modernized and fitted into billboards and a new video. And then if you, if that's not enough of you watching, um, uh, you know, scantily dressed blondes laying on cars driving around Hollywood, you can actually watch the, um, you can watch a video of how they made it. It's not a long, long uh, behind the scenes uh, video. I think we'll put it in the in the show notes. But just a little bit about how they go about the whole sophistry of, of making this stuff. So as you say, the stones are 80. And um, I don't know what's going to stop them, really. It doesn't look like anything. What's amazing, too, is the amount of press uh... Jagger's been getting. I mean, there's a profile in the Wall Street Journal. There's a profile in the FT. I saw this clip today, like the, you know, the shark. I don't know if you, we get that show, The Shark Tank. There must be a similar show. In the UK, the sharks are inviting Mick Jagger because, you know, he's seen as his business genius now because he's kept the band alive for 60 years and et cetera, et cetera. And um, the FT had a great profile just talking about how uh, Keith is like already written his autobiography, but, you know, Mick's out there using Instagram and he's still, you know, with the kids and in the well, famously and... Mick was was given a million quid many many years ago, thirty years ago, to write his biography, and he had to send it back because he admitted he couldn't remember most of what had happened in the nineteen sixties and seventies. But the the other interesting thing about them, and this may give hope to us all, is you go through a period. Um, well, it hasn't happened to me, but you go through a period where you become well-known in a field or you're, you're considered a sort of leading light in something, then inevitably people trash you and say you're out of date, it's very old, yeah. hat. you're stuck from 20 years ago. And there was a period of actually quite a long time ago when they were criticised and people said, you know, isn't it a bit sad that guys in their 50s are sort of jumping around doing this stuff. But they've, they've, kind, of, they've kind of got through that and out the other side. It's almost like a U-shape. And as yeah. you say, I think they're, they're as popular now as they were in, say, the 
1970s. Now they're hot and uh, yeah, it's exciting to watch and um, check it out. I'm gonna check out the behind, I love the behind the scenes stuff, that's good. Um, all right, I haven't read this book yet, but it was just given to me. This is my friend, Michael Keane, who is a adjunct professor at Pepperdine. He's an investment banker, cultural historian. He lives in beautiful California. Um, he's written several books on Patton. He wrote a book on guerrilla warfare. He's a very interesting guy. This book is on Charles Schultz. I don't know if you know uh, Peanuts. Do you know the Peanuts cartoon characters? Oh, yeah, it's very big over here, Charlie. Brown. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So this is the behind the scenes story of Charlie Brown's Christmas, how it came to life. Um, what's interesting is Schultz was in the military. He creates the peanut characters. Coca-Cola is looking to, how do we start selling more Coke? They see, you know, let's find a Christmas special. It's all come together. So it's a very interesting book. He just dropped it, uh, but it's like how it never really came to television. The behind the scenes at CBS, you know, Coca-Cola getting involved the period, et cetera. So check that out. Charlie Crown, Charlie Brown's Christmas Miracle. So this is this is an untold gift. story. This is a gift for people for Christmas and it's your first early Christmas recommendation. Well, it dropped exactly just in time. Um, and Michael's a good friend. We've collaborated on some uh, thought pieces. Uh, I've lectured to his class. He's a really good guy, very interesting. Got more degrees than you, which is almost impossible. Um, but anyways, I think you'd really like him. He's a smart, interesting guy. Right. And he's written these, um, I don't know, like a whole book on a television show. I don't know. I find him, he's a very talented and disciplined guy, which is good. So check that out. And then I watched this amazing 45 minute documentary, BBC, fantastic. The Secret World of Sandwiches. I mean, I love a good sandwich. I don't know if you've seen this, but it started with the railroad sandwich. I guess the railroad, the train company had the biggest, as the biggest cafeterias in the UK, right? And they were the forerunners of the sandwich, I guess probably in the 60s, right? And then yeah. Pret de Manger gets involved, these uh, independent sandwich shops, Subway, but a 45 minute documentary dedicated to sandwiches. I guess you guys call them, you, you, call them Sar was, you call them Sarnies in the UK? I never heard that. Is that well, Sarnies? interesting in the UK, in, yeah, the Sarnies is a sort of slang term, may come from Cockney, I don't know. Um, but interestingly, in the 1960s, there was this dreaded piece of food called the British Rail Sandwich. And it yeah, was it, because of these sandwiches, yeah, exactly. Um, it that were peeled up, right? They were kind of out of date and a bit stale and everything. Yeah. But they were the only thing that was... Uh, you could order at a at a railway uh, sort of cafe or, you know. Yeah, you'll love it. So what happens is m &S, this is a great documentary. m s gets involved, right? Marks and Spencer's. Yeah. This guy spends a year figuring out the protein balance. He finds a wheat from Canada that has more protein and the bread can stay in those packages for four days and doesn't get soggy because it's thicker. Unbelievable. So that like revolutionized the whole, you know, bread situation. Um, but yeah, I guess the, everybody would eat these cheese sandwiches on the rail because there was nothing else to eat. But then so this is, like, this why is... can't we make these better? But it, it's a fantastic documentary. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. And there's another angle here, isn't there? Just thinking about it. This is, you know, the, this fashion over the last 20 or 30 years of um, how science has got involved in food. And this sounds like an early example. And of course, the, the big example over here is the Michelin chef, Heston Blumenthal, who famously sort of locked himself away for a year, almost in a chemistry lab, to work out which ingredients would work best and under what conditions. So in a way, this lot were there long before him. Yeah, I had dinner once with these guys from Syngenta, you know, the GMO, you know, and they were like, you know, because they were like, listen, we've been manipulating food and figuring out how to make it better forever. So, like, you know. yeah. But no, I think you'd really enjoy it. Fantastic. It made me want to get on a train. It made me want to go to pret Manger get a sandwich. Um, I don't know. Love it. Science, it's a long technology, way. marketing. It's a, long, it's a long way from those gambling tables where the Earl of Sandwich demanded a snack food because which that's, is, that's yeah. where the term comes from, isn't it? Which is absolutely, I always thought that was like ridiculous, but it's true. Yeah. yeah. Apparently he wanted a late night snack and he yeah, asked yeah. for ham and beef and or yeah, he made, he made beef, a right? mistake. He made a mistake that you would never made and you would have advised him immediately is he didn't copyright it or patent it in any form. I mean, <laughs> exactly. it was trillions of dollars. I mean, it's like, 
Anyways, that that alone is like, I mean, did nobody else think of like putting bread together with other proteins? I mean, it's like absolutely fantastic, You're right? And not, yeah, now today you couldn't do anything without being like, okay, like where's the patent attorney? You know, this is yeah, a delicious cocktail, yeah. but like, yeah, how do we scale like everything. it? Don't worry about the product, worry about the lawyers, right? That's the first yeah. thing you do these days. Can we buy the URL? Is the URL available? Imagine if you were the Earl of Sandwich, you bought Earl of Sandwich.com. I mean, oh, that's clever. Yeah, you're, you're already <laughs> getting too clever. All right, everybody. That's, yeah, that's enough cleverness for everybody. That's this week's ructions. I guess we'll be back in two weeks. I doubt anything exciting will happen. Right? Who knows? It'll be a slow two weeks. <laughs> All right, Gerald, we'll see you in a few. Thanks, buddy. This is great. Take care. Bye-bye.